Celtic are back at the top of the table. Kyogo's back on form, and myself and James are back with a, a morning after the night before final whistle show as Celtic beat St Johnson 3 1 at Celtic Park. James, your initial response to yesterday's win? Yes, so, you know, some things starting to, to click a wee bit. I thought some of the football and passages yesterday was really good, really positive, uh, flowing stuff. Three goals, could have three more, could have been a penalty, blah, blah, blah. So, all very positive, top of the league. Um, we spoke about it in the, the weekly show, I think, on Monday. I mean, if you give me another, what, eight of them in the league? Is that right? Yeah. And two in the cup, that's your got double. So, yeah, if Celtic play like that the rest of the season, they win the league in the, in the cup. Yeah, so that was match day 30 of 30. Obviously, we now know uh, we're recording here just before two o'clock on Sunday afternoon. We now know Rangers game at Dundee hasn't uh, gone ahead. Thoughts are with all those who travelled all that way for nothing, but that's just how football goes sometimes. What do you make of that in terms of a, from the side of view, though? So obviously Celtic went top yesterday and it may or may not have just been temporary until Rangers game against Dundee. We now know we get an international break. We're top of the pile for the next two weeks at least. And Rangers will have to fit in that fixture somewhere along the way. What do you think of that as a just as a, a situation? Steve in the comments has just took the words out of my mouth. Burton hands were through in the bush. Um, everyone in football would always rather have the points than be chasing points. So yeah, I'm done delighted with that. Um, it gives them a bit of time to rest after Europe. You can make positive and negative arguments from their point of view. But for us, we're top of the table and we'll remain so until they can get that fixture dealt with. It looks yeah. like the most available uh, free slot will be the week before our game against the Ibrox. Is that right? That could be interesting itself. But uh, for the meantime then, James, uh, mind the gap, mind the one-point gap at the top of the table. <laughs> um, let's take it into the game then, uh, ahead of St. Johnson. Another injury and force change at centre-half. Now, we've been debating Liam Scales kind of all season, haven't we? You know, should he start, should he not? Um, but he misses out through injury, and it's another enforced shuffle for Brendan Rodgers. Thankfully, Cap Cameron Catterbuckers was coming back in, but what do you make of the starting lineup in general, including the centre-half positions? Uh, the, the, apart from Scales or Welsh, I think we called the team. Um, Hart Johnson, CCV, Taylor, Tomoki, O'Reilly. Oh, no, I called Kelly, I actually said the Bernardo. Uh, Kuhn, Dyson and Kyogo. So, um, I think in hindsight, Kelly should have started. I thought Bernardo was gave us a nothing performance, didn't he? And he's got it in him. Yeah. It's really quite frustrating. Um, but the light start lineup was, was generally positive. I don't think there's an awful lot in Welsh and Scales in terms of difference. It's CCV is the maker there. Yeah, he is. That, that was the most important thing that he returned. I thought that Stephen Welsh was perfectly fine yesterday. He wasn't troubled or challenged that much, to be honest with you, from a defensive point of view. Although, as we'll get to, Celtic do lose a you know a cheap goal later on in the, the proceedings. But across the board, yeah, it was a fairly predictable lineup out with the centre half situation. I would say based on what we know, right? So obviously we don't see what's going on at Lennox Town, who's performing, who's not, you know, is Lager Bielka having a nightmare up there, for example, because he's not he's not favoured for different reasons. Is Bernardo doing particularly well? Because he's now had I think two or three too many nothing games, as you say. He's given a chance there in the midfield and it's almost hard to rate him because he just didn't get involved enough. You couldn't say he had a poor mm. game. You couldn't say he had a good game. He just The game kind of passed him by. So he's not making big mistakes, but he's also not having a big impact. And I think there is now a call for for Daniel Kelly to get a chance here. We're in a position where the next game is Livy away. Sorry, Livy at home. I need to check that. Livy, I think it's Livy away on the 31st of this month. And then it's Rangers on the 7th of April. So if you are making a change in that midfield, it's not a lot of time for Daniel Kelly to bed in and get used to it. But Mm, I don't know. What about further up? We'll get to it in more detail, but Kyogo gets an odd over either. Um, and ultimately, it looks like it was the right choice on the day. Yeah, he was on his toes. Uh, Kyogo, I thought he played really well. You know, he, he pushed for man of the match, I would say. Couldn't really nip him on that one. Um, I, I don't think there's an awful lot between them. I think both Ida and Kyogo bring positive attributes in different ways. You know, even when Ida came on, he had a good chance. You know, he put himself about. It's a different kind of game. It's more physical when Ida's there, which, you know, again, considering the likes, I maybe would have gone for Ida um, before it started, uh, before the game started. But Kyogo more than justified his inclusion, sure. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, there's various comments coming in, and, and we encourage any comments or thoughts you've got, um, whether it's on the game specifically or, or bigger picture stuff. A few folks saying Coon impressed, they definitely did. Celtic look much more assured by Cameron Cattle Vickers. And, and there's no escape in that. He, he makes such a difference in terms of two things. He's a very good footballer. And, and by that, I mean not just a good defender. He can play ball. He's got a nice touch. He controls it well. He's got a nice technique. But for me, it's always his Cameron influence at the back. I think everybody from Joe Hart out just feel so much more assured. Fans as well. Actually, we all feel so much more assured when he's part of Celtic's you know, back line. Um, the first half itself, James, that, you know, obviously you and I are there together and I think um, Celtic were well in control. We weren't um, cutting them apart at will, but we basically lived in their half and we we eked out several chances. I thought Nicholas Coon in particular was, was playing his part. Maida giving you that work rate as always, but the best stuff was coming through Nicholas Coon for the most part. Yeah, I mean, I, I, if anything, I said to you, yeah, the game, if anything, I think we were guilty of not involving, involving him more, you know, he had that boy in toast. The boy doesn't know if he was going to cut inside or hit the byline, which is exactly where a winger wants to get a defender in the headspace of, I don't know what side you're, you're going on me here. And I just don't think we fed him enough. I think if we had done, I mean, maybe done a wee bit more in the second half, but if we'd fed him more, I think we'd get more out of him as well. And it's great for his confidence. You know? So it's a funny one. Um, all the, the dental stuff and the weight loss, which is significant weight loss for a for an athlete. Um Looks like it's it's true, and he's starting to show what we thought we'd seen. Yeah, James, you and I could both do with some dental work and some weight loss, but that's a <laughs> completely different chat altogether. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, there's a there's a suggestion, and I would buy into this suggestion that Tomoki Wata. I thought he had a reasonable game yesterday, but he was very very safe. You know, he was yeah. doing the did I say the Neil Lennon type thing, and it's something that frustrated a lot of fans when Lenny played, but sideways passing, backways passing, but ultimately not not giving the ball away much at all. There was times where you were desperate for him to make that pass because at the game, you know, it's maybe different when you're on the field of play, but at the game in the stands, you, you see the Kyogo run, you see the Maeda run, and a few times too many, we didn't quite make the pass. And Awata himself was maybe particularly in the fire line for that. But actually, you've got to give him credit. We talk about Nicholas Kuhn there. In the first half, Awata's played a great through ball to him, probably the, the, yeah. the most adventurous pass he did make. Um and I'd like to just see a wee bit more of that, but maybe he's under instruction not to, or maybe he's also in a position where he's not had his best yeah. couple of games in recent times, and he's maybe just said to himself, well, I'm going to make sure I don't make a mistake. What do you think of how he, he approached the game? I think it is under instruction. You know, Roger's priority in every game is to control the game first and foremost, and your kind of water carrier stuff that, that Tomoki will do, it can be quite boring, but it does allow you to exert control in the game. So, um, yeah, I think he's, I think he's got real talent, and I think he's got real talent for that number six. I think he un unlocks a lot for us. So, the more games that go past, and the more he settles into that role, the happier I am. Um, you would like to see him be a wee bit more ambitious, but I don't think that's his job necessarily as well. I think that's for someone else. He's there to mop up, fetch and carry. And if someone else wants to make the, the killer pass, that's up to them. Yeah, so yeah. another 90 minutes for Tomoki Lennon and we'll see if he keeps his place. We've got that situation in midfield where I wonder if Bernardo, in fact, I, I'd be pretty sure Bernardo is just keeping that shirt ready till Callum McGregor can return. There's been so many stories, so much speculation as to just how long Cal Mark will be out for. But the real hope is that he's back after this break. We've discussed the fact, though, that so I've just double checked. We're away to Libby. We're on that surface. It's not a great place to reintroduce someone, whether it's Kalmak or Rio Hitati. And Celtic, maybe now's not the time for this chat, but just to touch on it briefly, Celtic could be gambling going to Ibrox on the 7th of April by throwing in a couple of guys that haven't played much game time. What do you think? Is that the, the move to make? One of two. I don't think we'll see much of Rio until mid to late April. I think that's when we'll see the... the any impact from him. I think he might come off the bench at Ibrox. I think McGregor will start if all goes according to plan as it seems to be at the moment. I think you've got any issues putting a McGregor into a game like that because he's played it so often and he's bossed it so often. Um, he won't have any issues in terms of playing at Ibrox and stuff, just coming back from injury. So I think that's the way it will go. McGregor will be ready for that one, but maybe just too early for Rio for me. Yeah, so very interesting. I think the break's come at a good time for Celtic. Um, you know, we've kind of picked up an important three points yesterday, but you can now 
A, get some guys back from injury. So all of a sudden, the injury list is now Rio Hitati, Callum McGregor, Liam Scales added to the mix, and Louis Palmer. It gets those guys back as potentially all, all four of those guys, and obviously Carter Vickers were managing at this moment in time. These guys could all have a huge part to play at Ibrox. Um, but the most important thing, you know, yesterday was getting those three points and, and worrying about that later. But it also gives guys like Matt O'Reilly and, and other guys of that out maybe just need just a wee bit of downtime. It's been quite a relentless nice. time. And saying that, he, he now has been called up by Denmark, hasn't he? He's been called up. Um, I'm kind of hoping, you know, it's great for him to be involved in squads, obviously, but I'm kind of hoping he, he's something not used. He needs a break. I mean, it'd be even nicer if he wasn't travelling. He could get some genuine downtime. But he saw me yesterday. You know, guys get talent all over the place, but he's so leggy. Mm. So, I think that's, it's a tough one. Celtic obviously can't deny him or deny even Denmark uh, that O'Reilly goes, but I wish they could. Yeah, I think um, he'll he'll be boosted by that and hope as it returns more confident and more back to his best. But he has looked a bit heavy-legged in recent times. In a more positive sense, Celtic have agreed with the US national team that Carter Vickers won't travel and he'll continue his, his recovery back here, he's which is good. Um, to get back to the game, so Celtic do get the ball in the net from Kyogo. It's the one that he chested in, James, but I'm quite happy that he was, he was clearly offside for that one. Um, and he's then got, he's opened the scoring and he's got the opening goal. And it's Nicholas Kuhn, and it's a ball we've kind of seen a few times now from Nicholas Kuhn. He starts on the right wing, he cuts inside to his left foot. He clearly is very two-footed, and he clips a perfect ball into Kyogo. You maybe don't see this at the time. I certainly didn't pick it up at the game, but having watched the highlights since, his run is exceptional. He actually starts in front of the defender, kind of just does a look the loop He circles the guy to the point where he doesn't know where he is, and he glances ahead header in, um, ahead of, is it, is it Mitov, Dimitar Mitov, the goalie, who's a decent goalie. Um, but it's a really good goal for Celtic. Then modern football being modern football, you need to wait two or three minutes for confirmation. Thankfully, we get the nod, but it's a it's a really good goal to open the scoring. Yeah, and it's you know, I think it's for Kuhn. Um, the defender's thinking he's not in any real trouble there because Kuhn's essentially facing his own goal. But then he just cuts, same as he put that ball into Maida last week, just cuts and uh, just, it's an inch-perfect pass to Kyogo. It's tight in terms of line, but he's well, well on side. How it took him so long, I don't know. Um, and quite brave from Kyogo as well. Mitov's coming flying out, and I, as you see it, you're thinking he's going to take a sore one here, but he just manages to get ahead of the goalie and just runs at home. Lovely goal. Yeah. yeah. It looks like he'd added it just a few minutes after. Um, Maeda finds himself in a position at the back post. He nods it into Kyogo's path, and he finishes high into the net, but clearly offside, so, so no problems there. But what that yeah. does indicate... Uh, and you know the stats will back up is just how much dominance Celtic had during that first half it's one thing controlling possession and what we've seen at times this season is the stats are telling you Celtic are 70-75% possession yeah. but not creating the chances t- to go with that but what we've seen yesterday is you know goals chopped off for offside some guys even handballing things on the line James we'll cover that in a second uh, handballs on the yeah. Celtic hitting the woodwork we're creating the chances to go with the possession. And that's the most encouraging thing. And that's encouraging for Brendan Rodgers because I say this a lot, but I think a coach's job in its simplest sense is to set up a team to create chances. If individuals on the day are off form or fluff the lines or whatever, there's not a great deal a coach can do about that. But his job is to create a system which which creates the chances. And I think Brendan Rodgers has done that. Um, you know, So credit for that. What about the penalty incident? So you were adamant at the time. Don't worry, we're getting the penalty here. They'll do the check and we're good to go because that definitely looked like a handball. It is a handball. We've seen it. We've seen the replay now. It catches the guy maybe elbow-ish and mm-hmm. it just depends on your interpretation of the rules at this moment in time. But people are saying the arm is in close to the body so you know there's nothing they can do about it. And I suppose if that is the rule, then that's one thing. But surely the rule should be if a guy uses any part of his arm to prevent a goal, you know, deliberately or otherwise, then it must be a penalty. Then what you get is the farce that uh, Awata is punished for at Hearts, but he's not looking at the ball. It's in a very... Uh, uh, it's not in a dangerous part of the box. He's in the edge of the box. There's no chance for Hearts. It falls out the sky, hits his arm. Penalty, whereas a guy blocks one on the line with his arms, no penalty. And it will sound like I'm greeting because it's Celtic stuff. I would be moaning at watching that from a neutral point of view because how can that be the rule? where a clear goal scoring opportunity has been prevented, but it's no penalty, and a Watas is. Make sense of it for me, please, James. 
Can make sense, but that's the whole point. Um, that this just comes off as bitter Celtic fan, whatever kind of thing. But we're seeing things being interpreted that go against us, and they get interpreted a certain way. And with, when they're to go for us, they don't go that way. Um, th- th- this will be the basis of Celtic's case um, to the SFA next week, whenever that is. Um, is that the inconsistency, incompetence, bias, call it what you will. Um, if that guy's arm isn't there, it's a goal. It's, it's as simple as that. I think that is a harsh uh, handball because he can't do an awful lot about it. He does raise his hand slightly towards the ball. So then you can make that argument that he's moved towards the ball and he's, he's made a block. So the thing is, you can argue that's a penalty and there's a certain team would get that penalty and it's not us. No, it's not. I think what we need to do Football-wise, not just Celtic-wise, it's just simplify this rule and be clearer. If it's something that prevents a goal, deliberately or not, it should be a penalty and one or two nuances around that. But at the moment, as I said before, I, I think I used the term that I feel sorry for refs. I got absolutely shot down for that, so I'll maybe not repeat it now. But you can understand the point. Natural body shape, silhouette, leaning towards the ball, close quarters, all these kind of things. It's just get very confusing. And it seems the rules are changing every other season as well. So let's just simplify it and let's be more real about it. You know, let, let's give penalties. Penalties should be given in quite an extreme thing. A goal, in, football's a low-scoring sport. A goal is a huge thing. So let's not be giving out penalties well and early for silly stuff. But when it, you know, it, when it disadvantages the attacking side, then I think that's when you've got to give it. But we'll move on from it, James. So we get to half time. We're one nil up and good to go. How are you feeling at half time? Are you fairly relaxed? You know, it'd be nice to get a, a couple of goals cushion. But are you quite happy with the way things are going at that stage? I relaxed. I mean, in terms of how St. Johnson set up, I can't remember Joe Hart having a safety make in the 90, never mind in the first 45. Um, the only save he made was to parry the one out for uh, their goal. Excuse me. So, yeah, I was comfy, but you know, you need goals on the board because at 1 0, they can sneak one, even at 2 0, it puts you, you know, a bit nervy. So, getting back out to set half for the second half and starting as you left the first was, was really positive, I felt. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so we get into the second half. You don't need to wait long at all. It's Nicholas Kuhn that gets the goal. There's someone um, earlier on in the comments, I'll try and dig it out, but talking about Brendan Rodgers not getting the best from Kyogo, I've got it here. So John Clement says, it's been criminal the way we've neglected to play to Kyogo's strengths for so long and we now seem to be giving him service. Kyogo is so important to the team make him the focal point, Brendan. And I think it's spot on from John. He's absolutely right. I think we did make him the focal point yesterday. And I'm not I'm not entirely convinced that Rodgers hasn't been deliberately playing to uh, Kyogo's strengths. But what you've seen yesterday was kind of the Kyogo vault. He's making the runs. He's he's sharp. He's on the shoulder. His first goal epitomises that. He's had two other goals chopped off in the first half. He's cracked the underside of the bar in the second half. And at this point in the game that we're talking about, he creates the, the assist for Nicholas Kuhn. But the assist in itself is a thing of real quality because he makes that run in the channel that he always makes but doesn't always get picked up on. And real credit to Greg Taylor, who plays a really clever pass, you know, a left-footed curl pass into Kyogo. It's just out of reach for the defender. Kyogo latches on. He's then got his back to the St. Johnson goal as such, but he swivels and he hits it into an area. And we've spoken about this in recent weeks. You don't need to look up and say, where's my right winger? Where's my striker? I need to find where they're going. Just find an area and it's their job to get into that space. Yeah. And Nicholas Kuhn's done brilliantly as well. He's come here and in at the back post, like all good wingers should, and he's tucked it away. But there's credit all round. Brilliant by Taylor, clever by Kyogo, yeah. and Kuhn, you know, stepping on to to pick up where he left off. Everyone's seen how well he done against Livingston last week, but then said, but you need to now go and do that the next game. And I think he's done just that. It's great to see a bit of a a relationship and an understanding form in there. You're right. I mean, Kyogo doesn't need to do an awful lot of work as to who's in the box and who isn't. He's just putting it into that area. Kuhn anticipates it really, really well. Um, it looks like the defender's poor, but it's actually Kuhn is just really sharp and he gets way ahead of him. He's about two or three yards ahead of him when that ball starts to come in and then he's just got the goal at his mercy. So they've done their hard work early, the pair of them, and it's, it's a great goal, you know, and it just gives us a wee bit of comfort there. Yeah, it really does, and it you know, starts off the second half in the right tone. I was critical of Kuhn, absolutely, um, based on his first few games. And, the, you know, there's some people saying, oh, where's all the Kuhn haters now? So I wouldn't call myself that, but I think he was due criticism because he didn't start life at Celtic in the way that, that we all hoped. He was the 
he was the big January signing at a time we were crying out for somebody to make an impact in the second half of the season. We've already covered the fact he had dental treatment. He lost around about eight kilos, apparently. And with it, he lost a bit of his pace and power, which is clearly part of his game. What he has showed in the last couple of games, and I think in both of them, he's had to go off with cramp, which I'm OK with at this level. He'll need to continue to build up. But I don't mind any player giving his absolute all for 70 minutes and then putting the pause up and saying, my work here's done, let's bring somebody else on. Um, and we kick on on that basis. But I think over the last two games, he's shown that he very probably will now have a part to play you know, in these closing games that we maybe never thought just a few games ago. No, you know, we looked like we were really struggling despite having bodies as wingers. Looked like we were really struggling for quality. Um, George Barnes made a really interesting comment there um, and asked you at the game. So Yang was bang on form when he got taken out um, by John Beaton, no less. Uh, so he's now back available for the Levy game. If it, if it wasn't for Kuhn's last two games, he'd be going, well, that's dead easy, Yang straight in. But Kuhn has definitely done enough to keep that shut. I think you've got to give it to the guy with the momentum. I'd like to see maybe Kuhn then pick up on the left. He played a lot uh, for Rapid on the left and Yang on the right. And it's just all out football. Your argument, quite rightly, is that Maeda gives you all that defensive stuff, but it gives you poor quality football from a technical point of view. The two of them are technicians and they'll get you goals. I would lean towards that, as George is suggesting. Yeah, so George's question is, do we go Kuhn, Kyogo, Yang? Uh, all three Touchwood should be available now for the next game. And then obviously the Rangers game after that. So it's a decent argument. Um, it would be rare for Celtic in these last couple of years to go without Maeda at Ibrox. But the, what, what you've got now, um, to roll out the cliche, is good headaches for the manager to have. All of a sudden you've got genuine quality chap in the door there and saying, well, listen, you know, Yang and Kuhn can both now say, well, I'm due a start. You know, Kuhn will say, I've done my bit over the last couple of games. Yang will say he impressed up until he's sending off. So there's now guys that are, I would say, turn, you know, turning up at the right time of the season. You know, it's a long old season, but now's the business end of it. And I think it's a really great situation to have. The Prophet, you know, a good friend of the show, he's made a comment that you can't judge Kuhn in just two games. And I'm not sure if he means just the last couple of games, but if, if it is based on that, what I would say is signs are very encouraging. You know, that that's all we can say. You can only, you know, judge on what's happening in front of you just now. He was man of the match yesterday. He was man of the match against Levy. And that's all he can do. You know, he's, he's had a sticky start to life at Celtic, but now he's in a position where he's starting to influence games, and that's exactly why we've signed him. Um, going across the rest of the second half, James, you'd be hopeful for more goals. You know, you'd be, you know, as a fan, you'd always want three, four, and five. It's not quite turned out that way. Um, but we've made a few changes, and amongst them, um, at some stage, Daniel Kelly comes in. We spoke about him pre-match. I think he's nice and tidy. He's not having a huge impact on games, but I think he's nice and tidy. At the moment, do you think he's a better option than Paolo Bernardo? He's given me something, Kelly. You know, I noticed him when he came on. I didn't notice Bernardo at all um, in the game. So for that reason alone, you, know, you said earlier on about Bernardo that he didn't have a, a good game, didn't have a bad game. Um, you just didn't notice him. That's a bad game. Your job is to be noticed and do noticeable things. So... Um, I think Kelly's got a way to go. He's a young guy. He's just coming into uh, the first team. But yeah, I, f I mean, obviously the choice is McGregor. But in the meantime, I think Kelly starts ahead of Bernardo. Yeah, we've got a tricky situation where the team that you would pick, you want consistency, don't you? We've spoken about that you know, throughout the year. We've lacked consistency. You would want to pick the, the same team for the next two games. But I think the conditions at Livingston added to the injury situation we've got. It makes that less clear. John Clements makes another good point, though. Maeda for Ibrox, Kuhn and Yang for home matches. And it's different guys to unlock different defences. So, I don't know. I think we can only focus, or the manager can only focus on, on what's ahead of him. It's all right for us to speculate two, three games down the line. But they'll look, first and foremost, you've got to beat Levy uh, to make it you know worthwhile moving forward. That, that's the most important game. And we'll see what goes beyond that. But yeah, so Daniel Kelly, he came on for Bernardo in the 63rd minute. Yeah, right, he showed more of an impact than, than the Portuguese did. And at the same time, James Forrest, forgotten man James Forrest, <laughs> comes back in for the second game in a row and has a pretty notable impact. You've got to say, and I think we touched on it last week, he's really looking after himself physically. I think he's mm -hmm. in great shape. He, you know, he's a, he's a finely toned athlete and I think he's shown a very professional attitude for a guy who doesn't play a lot of football for Celtic now. But what he's saying is, and I think he accepts his place in the pecking order, but what he's saying is, I'm ready when you need me. And at the moment, with Yang suspended, with Palmer, 
injured, uh, and we've got another issue in the wing somewhere. It'll come back to me. But you've got issues in the wing at this moment in time. And James Forrest said, OK, well, now's the time when I'm needed. I'll be ready. And he stepped in, James, and he's he's a far safer player than he used to be. Uh, his focus now seems to be let's retain possession and try and eke out some chances rather than go at it all gl- guns blazing, you know, bombing at the fullback. But he keeps possession. He keeps ticking things, things ticking along. And then when his chance came, he stuck that away brilliantly with his left foot. Yeah, I mean, it's, he made it look really easy, which is a skill in itself. Um, first of all, to be in the right place, to you know, have that awareness and experience of where the ball's going to end up. Um, when Kuhn went off, I was a bit disappointed, thinking, well, James will come on, it'll be safe, and we'll probably finish this 2-0 rather than get another goal. But obviously, James had other ideas. Um, just, just tucked it away. Left foot, I'm a collector's item. Yeah, he was delighted with it as well. And I'm pleased for James Forrest. I, I think you and I have agreed much to Miff's disgust that James's time at Celtic is running down. The fact that he was available for transfer in January tells you that. But he's a Celtic man. He deserves all the praise that comes his way at different times. And again, he stepped up at an important moment yesterday. His goal puts the game to bed, you know, put it in its simplest form. Yeah. And you've seen the release from James. You know, he's not noted for overly energetic celebrations, but there was a real uh, buzz from him. And you're pleased for a guy like that, of course, you are. And it was a, it was a big goal at a key moment in the game. You've got a situation then where we know Celtic are managing Cameron Carter-Vickers' minutes at this moment in time. He's clearly not 100% and there's more important games ahead. So the manager makes the call to remove him. Uh, you know, with what, what is that? 15 minutes to go. So on the 75th minute, he makes the move. Gustav Lagerbielka is on the bench thinking, I've got to get minutes today. Liam Scales is out. Different things going on. Nav- Navrocki's not around. Here we go. He probably took the zipper off, ready to go. And the manager says, right, Odin, Tiago Holm, you're going on. And that's the move. So Tiago Holm comes on and Awata steps back into centre half. And Tiago Holm steps into that midfield spot. How do you feel at that moment in time? And what does that say? Does that say that, you know, obviously Brendan Rodgers has got all eyes on Lager Bielka. He sees him at training every day. Does he just not trust him? Is he just not confident even for 15 minutes against a St. Johnson side that you're 3-0 up against? He just doesn't have the confidence to put him in there? No, no, my analysis of it is um, that he knows Lager Bielke is a, is a better centre-half than Tomoki. That's that's a given because when we lost the goal, his first move was to push Tomoki back into midfield and bring Lager Bielke on. So you know he's a centre-half there. I think he was prioritising giving home some minutes in his legs. There was some part of his development that was saying, you know, this guy's got to get some game time. And I wanted to see some game time. He was pretty ropey when he came on, but it will be so rusty as well. So I think that's all it was. It was prioritising home, thinking we're seeing that up. I don't really need to be overprotective at the back. Um, and then we lose a goal and he goes, well, maybe I should show that up. And he brings on his defender then. Yeah, I heard some chat on the radio driving home with you from the game that the he's made that move. Yeah, he gets minutes in the legs for Odin Thiago home. And then we lose that goal. And Celtic, all of a sudden, any time we lose Carl Vickers, we look far more nervous, far far weaker at the back, and that's exactly what's happened. It's a cheap goal to lose. There's a lot going on. Yeah. Greg Taylor gets caught under the ball. I don't want to be too critical of that, but it's one of the very few St. Johnson attacks. And Joe Hart, as he has done, he's stayed alert and he's pulled off a big save. And then it's their guy, not our guy, that's fallen up to smash it high into the net. And I think at that moment in time, the manager sees the error of his ways, potentially. I thought it was a puzzling substitution. I have to say, I understand managing minutes and stuff, but just see out that game. Can we go and win 4-0 rather than 3-1? Because who knows in terms of goal difference. But he makes the move that he does and then corrects it. Lager Bielka then comes on in the 86th minute. And I don't know how good or bad he may ever become, but from a confidence point of view, it must be hard for him to get his headspace into that because he wanted to move in January. Carl Vickers gets injured, so he has move is you know, put on ice for now. And he just, again, like James Forrest, he has to be fit and available at all times. He can't fault his professionalism. He's making himself available to play for Celtic, but it's not a great place for him to be, is it? No, um, and my kind of gut instinct was that Celtic had handled that really poorly in January in terms of, you know, blocking his move. You know, but it was when Carter Vickers relapsed, essentially. And then it turns out he was needed yesterday. So you've got to say in hindsight... Celtic have handled it really well because they've made sure they've got cover. I don't know if we've got anyone coming out of the youth that could have stepped in there. Maybe. Um, 
but it's frustrating for the full lad, of course. You know, he just wanted to play football and he seemed to have a good deal going for him at, at, at Lecce. Um, it was all set to go. They wanted him, he wanted to go. But, you know, Celtic's priority is for Celtic and that, that has to be the way. If, you know, Carter Vickers ends up in the treatment table the next two weeks and you need a lagger Belka to come in against Rangers, you know, that, that, that could conceivably happen. So that, that's the prior, priority. But the simplest thing for Rogers would have been to bring him on yesterday and just give him game time at the point that he uh, took uh, Carter Vickers off. But like I say, maybe wanted to see a wee bit of what home could do. So you can, you can overanalyse these things as it sounds like I've just done rambling for the last two minutes. I was going to say you can spend three minutes on it, like you've you've just played out. Um, but you've got a, you've got a world of modern football where squad management and and I'm not saying this is Lager Bielka, but sensitive footballers is more of a thing than ever, and you need to you know manage the, the minutes and make them feel loved and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, only eleven of these guys can start, so it, it's a it's a near impossible task. And yeah, I just you know from Lager Bielka's point of view, he must be feeling out of sorts. But credit to him. Are continuing to show up and be available, and who knows? You know, you, I mean, the way the the season's gone in terms of injury, he might well have more of a part to play than we all think in the next what is it, eight league games and hopefully two cup games. So we'll only see how it goes. Uh, the game plays out. You're obviously hoping for a couple more goals, but it, it's not to be. Um, I think I tipped three one in the pre match, uh, which was which is fine. We don't get many of them right at all. But actually, in the lead up to the game, I changed it and I said to yourself and a couple of other guys, I think Celtic will be four one today. And Tomoki Awata has to make that 4 1. You've seen the chance at the death. I don't know how he misses that. It'd have been a nice boost at the end of the game for him and for the fans, but but it's not to be. But listen, you leave Celtic Park, James, you're in good spirits. We've spoken recently about first and foremost, it's all about the three points. We'll take performances second to that. Um, but all Celtic can do and keep on doing is, is looking after their own business and winning games of football. And that's what they've done. So, how are you feeling on the, the final whistle? Feel great, and I think you could feel that around, you know, the the fan base as we were leaving. You know, it's a kind of nice, you know, a real buzz about the places. The maestro says, you know, there was a nice wee buzz going out of the stadium. People were, you know, smiling and you know, talking about this that, and the next thing. So yeah, I, I think the, the performance has done that for us to give us the confidence that we're not going to make any more stupid slip ups that we did, you know, come back about four or five six weeks ago, and that they've. They've got the bit between their teeth and they're just going to drive home and get these games dealt with. So, yeah, yeah, I'm feeling very confident and very happy about it all. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the Prophet said that I've not mentioned Dyson's contribution enough. I, I thought he was fine yesterday and I don't follow him as a professional. Um, brilliant hard trick last week, but he's not had as much an impact. Games at home against sticky opposition and, and low defensive blocks aren't really Dyson made as bread and butter. So, you know, credit at different times, but I don't think, I think that's a game yesterday if we had the options you want a Yang and a Kuhn, for example. But we'll always give yeah. Dyson credit where it's due, Prophet. Don't worry about that. There's also a couple of kind comments coming from uh, Monte and Stephen Winning about the, the battle to save Celtic series that we've run in recent times. There's now, let me get my numbers right, there's now four parts available for that. We've got Matt McGlone from Celtics for Change, David Lowe, the financial analyst, Fergus is number two, Jim Orr from Save Our Celtics, and most recently, Tom Grant, ex-Celtic director. So they're all available now uh, on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And thanks for all the kind comments. I advise to get part five going live tomorrow morning with no less than Hugh Keevans. Now, some folks might be thinking, Hugh Keevans, he's not a, a big friend of Celtic these days, and that may or may not be the case, but what Hugh Keevans has, he's a guy who played a huge part in, in those things 30 years ago. At the time, he was a journal for the, the Scotsman. He worked on Radio Clyde, and he and several others played a huge part in keeping the Celtic story front and centre in the press in these pre-internet, pre-social media days. It's a, it's a brilliant episode not from my point of view, but from what Hugh brings to it. And I'd thoroughly recommend catching that tomorrow. So that'll be out, out around about late morning, maybe lunchtime tomorrow for anyone that wants to check that out. But thanks to everyone here for the kind comments. James, your own final comments then. So we're now top of the table and will be for the next two weeks. Your comments on that in general and how the players are feeling about themselves ahead of the all-important running. Yeah, I mean, you can't deny there's a psychological boost to getting back top of the table. Um, thought we could maybe have got it uh, hearts, but not to be. So we've got it now. We've got a game in hand, but we've got to win it. So uh, I think it's all turned out quite nice the last few weeks. You know, it's just been a bumpy ride, just even the last two and a half months. It's been a bumpy ride. So good to see things starting to sell. Good to see guys coming back off the um, injury uh, treatment table and stuff. So, uh, yeah, long way to go and a hard road to go. But Celtic have definitely got 
the capability to win this title, no doubt. Yeah, 100%. There's, there is a long way to go in the bigger picture, some real challenges ahead. But at the moment, Celtic are top of the tree and and you can never be more than that. So we're, we're pleased to be there at least for the next couple of weeks and we'll see what happens beyond that. Thanks to James for joining me here on a Sunday afternoon. Thanks to everyone who's joined us in the live comments as always. Thanks to those who listen in podcast format. As I say, we'll be back tomorrow with part five, Hugh Keevans and the battle to save Celtic. And we'll also then have the weekly show getting recorded tomorrow night, Monday night. So in the meantime, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Enjoy Paddy's Day if you can. And we'll see you again very soon.